Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Pop Marketing Podcast. It is in the dead middle of July here, uh, and I am, like everyone else, really wanting to get the family out for a, for a vacation, right? We've spent the entire last year inside, and, and everybody's thinking about island getaways, Caribbean cruises, heading up into the mountains to really just join culture again. But on today's pop marketing podcast, we're not going to be talking, unfortunately, about those sweet, relaxing, all-inclusive uh, tours of Mexico. In fact, I'm joined here by my good friend, brother from another mother, and Nordic crazy man, uh, Stefan Peterson. How are you doing, sir? Oh, fine, thank you. Thanks for being here again. It's, this is, I've, oh, I've been looking forward to this so long now because today it is the theme of all themes. <laughs> it's going to be a depressing talk ah, because we, I, want, I want to invite you all to go to Scandinavia, to the Nordic countries and feel what we have deep inside. I'm talking about Nordic Noir. That's right. I today, about, yeah. today it's Nordic Noir. And specifically, we know everybody is back on with travel, but taking a pop culture kind of bend in the curve, we decided to talk about something that's really specifically been building up over the last five years. And that it's kind of a dissect off of pop culture tourism, which is people going out to different places, maybe that, that, that movies, that fandoms uh, follow because a movie was filmed or something like that is going on. We're going to go into something even closer to what Stefan said, closer to my heart, my darkened black heart. And we're going to go into, and this is coined by Stefan, I haven't, I haven't heard it, is Nordic Noir. And people that will actually go out and tourism when it comes to, what is it called, morbid tourism, Stefan? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, to visit places where people actually lived and died, or if it's like a place where a, a tragic accident happened or something, you want to actually explore it and, and feel. It's like, a, it's like to visit a live Stephen King novel, I think, isn't it? Mm. You just want to... I think so. I think so. And we've seen in podcasts, especially the, the idea of true crime has just blown up over the last few years. And it's affecting how people travel and it's affecting, you know, what some would call an odd fandom of where these crimes take place or where these things happen in real life. And Stefan, you're the perfect person. You're our master of travel an understanding, especially uh, over there in Europe, where I'm always surprised by some of the examples you give. So today yeah. we're going to be talking about Nordic Noir and yeah. travel on the darker side uh, on this bright and sunny July day. So explain a little bit about Nordic Noir, Stevan, and um, yeah. a little bit more about how this picked up. Well, uh, Nordic Noir or Scandi crime we can call it as well. And also the term, I think in the UK, they talk about slow TV. So I'm going to be a little more like not uh, more dramatic and slow now. I'm going to tell you that it's a slowly told story that requires full focus. So you'll be able to follow the text and the plot. I'm uh, in. I'm in. And, and it's, yeah, it's a total opposite of CSI or Fast and Furious or that because... We are not interested in who murdered someone and what did they do? Because now in the Nordic Noir, we are more interested in why. We want to dive deep into the, the mind of both the detective, the policeman, but also dive deep in the head, in the mind of the murderer. That gives us a, a special like attachment. Often it's like, we are talking at the same time that we watch those series. We watch, we want to talk about social criticism. Like I know the sociological issues in the society and with all respect to perceived 
injustices, of course. So that is like the plot. And the, the main plot, uh, before I talk about the, what you talk about and want to ask about, I want to tell you a typical plot. Please. Okay. So this person, if it's you, Joe, you've been living is the, in this smaller city, village, up in the countryside, and you left it to become free. You have totally lost your illusions. And because of, because now you start working as a policeman, okay? And you've been working a lot. But I mean, when you are older, there is this brutal, horrifying murder in your village. So you need to return and you have to meet your childhood demons. And then, of course, you're going to meet, you have like uh, in the past, you have quarrels with siblings, you have dark secrets and hurt lovers and everything in a mix. And you need to confront it. So the return and you do, it's, it's soaked with anxiety. And you're going to have those slow panoramic views, as you can see behind me, the bridge, okay? With slow panoramic views over forests and empty houses and everybody feel the anxiety like pour out. So this is the plot. And you start to try to find this terrible serial killer or something. But at the same time, all people you meet have their mystery or have the dark history or something. That is what we need to feel now. And today in Sweden, because I am in Sweden now, uh, part of the Nordic countries, it's raining, so it's perfect. We like live 10 months a year in total darkness, in a bad weather, bad mood. So we start to get this feeling of like a suicide or something. It's, it's like a balance between uh, want to be drunk and want to be dead. So it's like that, okay? That is the plot for all those Nordic uh, crime series, the Nordic noir. And it's a genre. It's, it's yeah, a genre it because, I mean, by the way, the way you've, you've talked about it, sets the scene completely and I can put myself into a lot of movies and, and genre in, in the States as well that deal with that same kind of mood, right? That constant tension and mood. But what I think is super interesting is it is a mood over and specifically for Nordic because you're literally in the dark and, and yeah. for a certain yes. amount of year and it gets depressing. We have yeah, that. We, we hope. We hope for two months of good weather, okay, <laughs> in the year. But often it rains. <laughs> so it's like you, you go around there feeling like depressed all the time. So, so everyone there, it's... everyone there can connect with that feeling, right? Like everybody. So if you want to put a story together that really can connect everybody that lives in that environment or understands that you can really click in very quickly to everyone because everyone kind of has that feeling, which I love between somewhere between drunk and dead is, is should be an album name. So uh, <laughs> we can play. Yeah. Maybe it's uh, this is what makes the Nordic Noir so interesting. We can look like in a mirror a little yeah, we can just, we look into the media without illusions. We just see it as it is. So we dive deep inside the dark, sad the personality. You know? Well, give, give me an example of something there that's very much at the baseline of Nordic Noir. Like what is a, a, either a case or a movie or what is something that well, we can use as a baseline for Nordic Noir? Oh, yeah, yeah. There are two really, really famous and well-known uh, Nordic Noir uh, series. One is The Killing. It's called, it's a Danish, Forbrydelsen uh, is the name of it. Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, the Killing, okay. There we have this uh, college uh, girl that gets murdered, and I can't tell you about the story, okay. But anyway, there are two depressed cops trying to solve this and they like go in in their car around talking slow low voices all the syria through and it's like brutal realistic very like yeah what i say that the social depression all over it you know and we have of course the bridge 
I think that is also recorded in different. I think uh, you talked about Mexico in the intro, but there is uh, uh, one version that is Mexico and US. And the story of the bridge is, it is actually Sweden and Denmark because we are connected to each other with a big bridge that I have behind me. Okay, that one. And on exactly the middle of it. So it's Danish, Denmark on one side, Sweden on the other, is a, a body laying dead. They so it begins. So the police from Denmark and Sweden need to collaborate. But what they find out is that this corpse who is laying on the bridge is actually two corpses, the legs and the upper body. And now I spoiled it for everybody. Okay, but it starts a long series, like four, yeah? It's so good. And what do they do? Yeah, this uh, Danish uh, uh, guy who is the police, he is like, he is addicted to alcohol. He is depressed. His family have gone away from him. He's divorced or in a divorce and he fights for his kids. Okay. On the other hand, it's a woman from Sweden. She has this Asperger syndrome. So she's very special in everything she do. And all this collides with a lot of friction and they keep this trying to find this serial killer it's like for four seasons okay so you so you understand it's it's a daily life for two random people but with their problems and they need to collaborate but they don't want it and that's the whole start of it and it, this brings of course people to go to this bridge to watch, to see where the scenes were like recorded, and there is the police station, and there is that, you know. So it's uh, it's really, uh, it had become a tourist attraction. Well, let's talk about the tourist tra- attraction part of it, because yeah. I'm really fascinated. Well, now, I mean, Killing, we've he- I've heard of. Like Killing, mm-hmm. and India, I think they even made an American version, which probably mm-hmm. ruined it plenty by that. And this reminds me of, also, uh, True Detective feels like it kind of nabs, which is an HBO yeah. series, which kind of nabs a lot of this directly mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. this kind of feeling of these kind of depressed and and not uh, great lives of the people trying to solve this case or going back in time and trying to figure out whatever happened. And there's something about it just telling me like that makes me want to get into it, right? Get into why uh, not only who done it. But then it's a character exploration as well. And so it we, connects- we have the start. Yeah. The start was Twin Peaks, I think. Oh, yeah, it, absolutely. You know, right. Yeah. Like, it was like that. You walk around and everybody was like a possible killer, but you, you didn't know anything. It was really strange, but it's kind of hit the nerve of this, isn't it? I, and, and that has its own. Ter- that has its own piece too of the Northwest, which of America, which is extremely has a vibe of that and guess what the vibe is also it rains all the time and it's up north so it gets dark longer and it's got that same kind of like almost creepy dark vibe well like dark underbelly but people are crazy and fandoms are crazy about these these stories to the point they travel to them now we is the bridge between was finding the center of the bridge uh popular before the bridge or was it just a very important bridge, of course, because it, it connects the two countries and I don't have to take the ferry. But mm-hmm. yeah, when did travel uh, come into the picture? When did tourism, did it happen naturally? Did people push for it? I think it has been like also before the, the moves, I mean, with books, if it's a, like a famous writer that wrote a good novel or a book, People are going to visit the places. I mean, the the Millennium trilogy with the the, the girl, uh, what is it called the 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 girl with the dragon tattoo yes. and the girl who played with fire and the girl who kicked the hornet's nest. Those um, there were books originally that created a, a huge, like amazing attraction to go to Stockholm. And I, I have. Now, I need to say something that's very bad for my own reputation, okay? Oh, but, uh, right, this is great. This is, we're getting it all, we're getting it all out. This is uh, yeah, yeah. I need to, uh, I just going to have some uh, 
yeah. Okay, I have to confess. Okay. And and now, yes, Girl with the Dragon yeah. Tattoo is amazingly Islam. giant and here in the States. I didn't States. believe for one second that those books should attract anyone. Okay, <laughs> so that is, I was at, at that moment, it was like 2008. Okay, back in 2008. Yeah. I was actually the boss for the tourist center in Stockholm. It's the capital of Sweden, okay? And they came from the city museum and they say, we have produced a map where you can uh, walk around in the scenes for the millennium films and yeah. the books. And we also have millennial tours so people can buy tickets to. And I said, oh, not another map, I said, because everybody had maps. And I said, it's not going to be a popular at all, okay? Okay, two years later, the marketing, the, the visibility, the marketing of the Millennium Film for Stockholm and the region, they, it was worth approximately like $96 million. And that was just two years after, and then uh, that's 2011. And after that, it's still going. It's still making people want to go to Stockholm to watch all those places and scenes. And for example, when they, 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 when they made the American versions, because they did that as well, it was like in two weeks after the premiere, it, 120 million people watched it. Understand the, the amount of marketing uh, possibility that there is. So, so I surrender totally, you know. It's like if you want to start shooting literature or movies in a city, a destination where people, you can use it, yeah, do it. That's uh, what I want to say, because it attracts people. You can do a lot. I was actually in New York. I was buying this iPad in Apple Store. Yes. And when yes. I wrote my I wrote my email and it was at Uppsala because later I was working as a marketing director for the city of Uppsala, it's a university city in Sweden. And when he saw Uppsala, he said, Oh, I know that. Because <laughs> on the CD, because it was discs at that time, okay, on the special, you know, the extra material that you get, they recorded. It was like a parade for children or something. It was recorded in Uppsala. And he said, I have always wanted to go there, he said, in New York, this salesperson. So it's a fantastic, the possibilities it, it gives us. Absolutely, for the places, and this is not new, you're right. When you're talking through this, it's not new. Shakespeare, from the very beginning, people are into going to the places where history has taken place. And to your point, millions of dollars, especially with films and uh, licenses that have to do where the, the, the place is a character, right, in itself, where the place is really a part of the story itself, yeah. instead of just whether it be superheroes or whatever, made up where the actual space is it. You're right in that it is a giant, you're not only marketing the movie now, but it also is marketing the space for people that are yeah. fans, right? For yeah. people that are beyond, oh, this is an enjoyable movie, but somebody who wants to get closer to the piece of art that was made. And I think that's it's really fascinating. And I also think it's really fascinating how in 2008, and you are, you pick up on things incredibly quick and are a, and, and a very smart, in tuned marketer, but that you, it was hard to see at that time. It was hard for you to see that that was going to be something that was going to be popular or that people yeah. would visit for that. And you know, the marketing director for the museum, they, she still laughs about it. <laughs> because I pretend to be, yeah, I know stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, listen, I bet this honest. is not going anywhere. This dragon tattoo, it's just not. But then the but, beautiful thing is it's going to happen no matter if you want it to or not. So you just pick up whenever it, right. uh, as it goes and you got to jump on the train. So this is actually a call to, to writers or actors or movie makers and everything. That it's to contact, to get in contact with destinations. Because if you can place the plot on that special small village or destination or a city somewhere, 
they are going to gain on it. And you are going to gain on when you write the book, you know, you can put the plot there. Yeah, it could be like uh, someone that everybody is gaining from it. Because, uh, yeah, as a writer, you need, of course, some money sometimes or filmmaking. Mm-hmm. And, and a destination, if they find, I, I remember on the Millennium Trilogy as well, it's a small cafe in the book, just short lines, this main character goes to this cafe. And they are still now, that was 2008, still people go there to have a cup of coffee or a fika, as we say in, in Sweden, you know, with a bun. They sitting there and feeling like they are a character in that book. So it's, it's amazing how to actually go through the, the pollution of uh, commercials. It goes really straight into your heart. Yeah. And you said something, too, that I really think is interesting, and it's that creators absolutely can, it benefits both, right? And creators can utilize that in negotiations, right? Because especially if it's a larger production or whatever it is that has that power, a smaller place or a place out of the way or a place that isn't LA or (laughs) New York is going to be going to let you do a lot of things that you may not have have access to a lot of things that you may have not had access to before. Um, So it makes sense and probably doing it with people that are very excited about you coming rather than people that are very annoyed that you have shut down a, a street or something like that. So you're right that it works on both sides. I do have a question when it comes to and getting back to Nordic noir and then morbid tourism too. We have the movie side, which makes sense. The movie and series side. And yeah. now with Instagram too, I would point out, like yeah. I've seen a lot of some of my favorite accounts and creators are ones that will actually go to where a movie was shot or a scene. And then they will hold up a picture of the scene of the movie and match it <laughs> perfectly, perfectly. So it looks like it just completely fits into the actual space. So they're not only hunting down the place, to have a coffee but the actual shot where the you know their cinematographer shot it they'll find the angle and find that scene and i think that's fascinating it's Um, like a cineast uh, bucket list i've been yes exactly at the same spot as the the other one but you have you like new zealand uh, the lord of the rings and it's like everywhere you go to these uh, places. And, and if you are smart, you can uh, do some uh, fine excursions and experiences connected to that special fictionary events. Yeah, so. and we have, we have Kauai of Jurassic Park. We have New Zealand of Lord of the Rings, which still brings in tourism. And somebody was smart, or I think they left the Hobbit holes there and of course that's on my list right like mm-hmm. and, and now you have you now you can take a picture and you are there and you're a part of that and you're closer to that so i get as a fandom it's something that i don't know if we take as big of advantage of as we can about the actual places and the spaces that movies and pop culture take part in now what i will say is we go into a darker realm now very yeah. bad we go into a darker realm into not crimes that are written but crimes that are that occur people, yeah, yeah, yeah. and people's fascination. What's really fascinating to me is that it is a fascination worldwide too. You know, it, in the US, we're very fascinated with our serial killers and uh, of the 70s and uh, certain kinds of crimes and big moments, right? Like it is, <laughs> it has become its own fandom in travel, but it is really interesting to hear that in Sweden, it is, there's clearly the same things going on. Let's talk about that a little bit more. What popular spaces are and that still fit in that Nordic noir that are real, that are the real true crime places? And, and are those popular as well for travel? All right. Yeah, it is. I heard a story about uh, this small ice cream stand uh, outside uh, Uppsala, as I talked about before, uh, in Knutby. Knutby is a small, small, small village. But it became famous or infamous, depending on what you say, because there was like this religious uh, sect there. 
And uh, it was like a really, really, it was like fiction, but in reality. It was like someone who sended text messages to one woman, pretending he was God, forcing her because she was the babysitter in one house. She forced her to kill another person. And it was like a lot of things. People were like uh, having affairs with each other and there was like uh, uh, rapes. And it was a lot of really strange things. But yeah. this small kiosk or this stand with ice cream sold a lot of ice creams the summer after because people were actually queuing to go there to watch, just look at houses and maybe they could see a curtain move. And it was like, wow, and they took pictures. And now it's actually, it is, it's actually a new, it's a new produced series on HBO, I think, uh, with a Knutby murders, where, where two uh, journalists try to solve the crimes, but looking at all the evidence once again. So it's like a, a, a mockumentary series about the killings. And uh, we have the south part of uh, Sweden, the bridge, as I told you, of course, it's really good. But on the Swedish side, we have Valander. Valander is a, a, a series also with this depressed man who uh, don't uh, have a good contact with his family or anyone anymore, and he tried to solve murders. Also, people go to Ystad, is the, the place where he lived. And they have like excursions and, and uh, guider, guidings and everything to, to show all the shooting scenes where it is. Yeah, where so the crimes good. actually occur. Right? Yeah, yeah. Where like, the uh, things actually uh, happen. Yeah. But uh, I mean, uh, yeah, and we, we also have someone murdered our uh, uh, prime minister a long time ago now. Okay. But it's still uh, the place where it was. Uh, he, the story was he went out with his family from a cinema and he walked towards the, the subway because in that time were no safety guards or anything. So they were like going with the subway you know? and someone got and shot him. And that had become, as well, I think they sold it, they say, last uh, yeah, in, in this year or last year. Because they said, okay, now we have been working on this case for like over 30 years. So now we, we need to have a, we can't do anything else. Okay, so, but it's still people going there and it's a small plaquette in the payment where it said it was here. So people put roses and uh, talking about. So it's, it's uh, so that maybe is uh, good for a lot of politics that they, if they do something wrong, something going to happen to them so they can, <laughs> tribute to their city <laughs> right, <laughs> make, right it's a, make a tourist they let, attraction out of them okay <laughs> they let you know the people let you know yeah. like it's yeah. you know, you'll be remembered forever but he so stands he stands in there uh, when they get uh, the job it says <laughs> small text if you screw up we have to shoot you <laughs> yes and here's proof here's where i get is and i've heard a lot of this too especially i listen to true crime and 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 i'm fascinated with it like anybody else and people can make their judgments on how dare somebody make these things that are crimes that have happened to people and i i completely understand that on a personal level that these happen to real people but and that they are things that we should that it just makes you wonder and this is my question to you like what is the fascination right because it's to say it doesn't exist or to say it's wrong is not going to help anything because we've always been fascinated with it. And, and you have your prime minister. We have JFK in Dallas. There is a yeah. immense tourist industry mm. built around that specific scene and morbid as it is, it is fascinating mm. to people and it does continue to uh, allow that story to be told of what happened there. My question is, why do people want these things that are so frightening and, and depressing and dark. What is the fascination? Why does it, we know it works. We know people come to see it. What is it that brings people to those things? Maybe it rounds up with the Nordic Noir definition as well. A little that all people uh, carry around a lot of baggage. I mean, from they were born until they get older and older and the fascination of other people the tragedy or the accidents or or anything you can leave 
the illusions on the side, you can watch it, but it's not you. You can just mirror yourself in it. So it, it, it's kind of fascinating because you can, you can actually watch some of your own fears, but it was not you who was involved. You can watch it. Maybe that actually triggers us. You know, it's always, when it is an, an accident uh, on the road, cars, it always cues. Yes. Because you, you drive a little slower because you want to watch it, you know. So it, it triggers you. And uh, maybe, maybe it is just because you were not involved in one of the scariest things you can imagine. And now you can watch it. You can, you can actually see it in a kind of a safe distance. I mean, I, I come to the same thought is that just like horror movies and, mm -hmm. and anything else is that it's a safe way to feel that fear or it's a safe way it's an it's something that's very human it's empathy like mm -hmm. to be able to step in and you said this from the very beginning to step into the character right to step in to these mm -hmm. crazy things to happen and and remind us that we're all that we're all just a few steps away we should appreciate what we have because we're just a few steps away of how crazy human nature can be even in the safest mm -hmm. of places how it can swing and how there's a little part of that in probably all of us right and uh it is it is fascinating and in your experience with this how are that, those travelers I, I really liked when you said it's a values play right like because mm -hmm. if i understand the fandom of somebody or i understand the things i can really cater travel towards them because i have i can understand them and the things that they like and what kind of feelings they want to feel whenever they come to a location or a place like to set that setting are these travelers known as good tourists or tourists uh, that cities and places would love to have has it been annoying to cities when this comes in and somebody who has done this for marketing for cities like what kind of tourists are are these morbid tourists and or um nordic mm -hmm. or tourists yeah um it's a really interesting question because you are actually putting the finger on something called sustainable sustainability and sustainability for for us when we try to when we work with projects for destinations to become more attractive as we we work. We, we talk about the balance between the businesses in the city, the authorities, and the civil society. I mean, the networks, the organizations, the, the people. So they need to collaborate to, to get an understanding. This is going to be popular now. This yeah. is going to draw people. How can we handle it? What do we want to use the tourists for? And of course, if you then create a move and just filming one corner, uh, where people live, and suddenly thousands and thousands of people are going to go there to, to watch this. It's going to be friction between the people who live there, actually, the, the real people and yeah. the, the tourists. So that, that means when you plan for this, when you make a movie and the city say, okay, you can make the movie here, you need to involve a lot of people. How can we use this in the best way? Because I think that the tourists themselves segmentation if it's called the segment uh, nordic noir tourists or morbid tourists or something they are kind of a cosmopolitan tourist they they want to learn about new cultures they want to meet people they want to be part of the daily life on another space on another place so they are kind of good tourists and they want to they want to put money on the destination as well they want yeah. to have those coffees and and the tours and and then buy a, uh, maybe a t-shirt or something yeah they want to they want to be part of the community yeah they're not looking so, for starbucks they are no. looking and things that are close to them they're looking to immerse themselves into yeah. the into the well into whatever they are going out there do they want immersion meaning they want to be part of that culture versus so you're right in that i yeah. would see that as that's what you want a, can they want that, some kind of connection that, yeah, that brings me to, we call it value marketing. You know, mm. you have certain values and you want, to, you, want to, you want to get to be known for those values because they are positive to you. So that means you should support books, writers, filmmakers, everyone that actually use the values you set positive for 
if they use it in their movies and films, it's going to bring people who uh, want to uh, connect to those values. So it's going to be a more balanced, a more sustainable way of tourism, I think. So that, that's good. And they should not then go to the, the big uh, chains of coffee shops. They should go to the smaller cafe because in the movie, the yeah. city has said, you film in this small coffee shop, not there. You create this place brand and good values for it. And that, that would be a, a cool uh, uh, cooperation between the city itself, the people who live there and the people who want to visit. Two things I did want to talk before we have to go. There is extreme, there is extreme morbid tourism, and we kind of dipped into it before we hit record. But mm -hmm. like, there is trips like I've heard to Chern like places like Chernobyl. Yeah, and is this a thing that has is has picked up over the years too? Is people really want? I mean, going to places where, and I, I also see it as these this fascination we have with places that are barren, or places that that look like somebody was just living in there weeks ago right like that they just left and that like whether it be a you know an old ferris wheel or or a city itself are there any other crazy destinations like what are the extremes of that and i think i think chernobyl is a good example i mean here is this uh, uh nuclear i say accident this kind of a small word word for yes. it, but i mean yeah uh and the whole destination is wiped out because of the radiation and everything. And nobody could be there for years and years. And I think it's just like uh, if it's two years ago or something, they, they actually decided to open up because it's a good uh, attraction for tourists mm -hmm. to go. But it's still a high level of radiation there. So you can just be there, uh, I think it's uh, four minutes inside it with, uh, with suits and everything. And then you uh, have to go from there because it's really dangerous to be there. But it still attracts people. So people are, it's, it's kind of, you know, to, to, it's like a social, uh, you want to show people that you are someone special. And that's why I have been visiting Chernobyl now. So I have this selfie from there. And then you have to go out again. So a that, place that where is, nobody can go. Yeah, a place where nobody yeah. should be. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and, and why would you go? I mean, that is a destination. For me, it would be a destination. Like you are, it's not a simple uh, feat to get on a, to, to take a tour, because I, I assume you'd have to go through a lot of, a lot of police and, and security yeah. measures and everything throughout that. But I guess it's part of the adventure, part of the, the I want it so bad and I want to be there so bad and say I was there that it's worth, I'll go further than yeah. others to get there. You like pay a million dollars to go out in space and back again. So uh, well, I mean, that's yeah. very much similar, right? Like, yeah. yeah. So it's it's a it's a kind of uh, I want to be there. No men have been before. You know, it's like that. And you also have a lot of tragic uh, deaths because of this. You know, the self, the hunt for a good selfie, and people climb on bridges and fall down, and or, or yeah, you know. So it's yeah. it's a uh, this drive that we have to be a very exclusive person that have done something no one else have done. Maybe push us a little too far often. Yeah, for, for the idea of fame, right? right yeah, for this, for idea this fleeting or fame. for just putting a picture on Instagram or Facebook, because that is maybe the closest thing we got to fame for, for, for a lot of us. I mean, yeah, and it's scary, and it's it, it shows us, and I it noticed it a lot through 2020. There's a lot of, from, you know, with everything that is fascinating and good, there is a point of where it is not so good anymore. Oh. I think it is, uh, it's interesting to be alive now and to kind of see all of this play out uh, and yeah. for us to kind of write um, these pieces of history for ourselves. Um, I'm fascinated. 
I uh, I think I'm not against including that in our vacations, right? Like I'm <laughs> not I'm not I I don't know if I could talk my wife into Chernobyl. <laughs> Chernobyl, <laughs> yeah, no. like, it's on the list. Space, oh, she's okay. like Chernobyl. <laughs> Is there any beaches in Chernobyl? Mountains? <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. not. It's, yeah. it's it's very rural. It's very rural. Uh, a nice okay. tan when you come. Oh, back. very nice, <laughs> uh, glowing, glowing green tan. I had no idea. Oh, and you've reminded me of these these places and spaces and mindset of Nordic noir and what it is. And right. now I'm going to go and gobble up, as I'm sure everybody else is, different pieces from it because I'm in that mood. Like I have the lights turned down a bit. Sun's not yeah. really out today and I'm feeling the vibe. And your picture back, it helps. The bridge. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're going to find exactly on the middle there, I think, was the body. And it's and what a great a plot point because it's a hell of a bridge because I have yeah, been yeah. I have been on a ferry from Denmark to Sweden yeah. in the south. And I didn't realize they had the bridge. The ferry was more fun. People were a lot buying a lot of booze. I, I had to ask a lot of questions. And then they were like, oh, yeah, it's cheaper if we buy it over the water. I was like, oh, and I mean, when I'm talking crates, people were come wheeling in. But the bridge, it, uh, how long is? Isn't it? A little, it's got to be a very long. Oh, I don't know. It's like... Uh... I don't know. It's, it's gonna be miles. It's gotta be miles. <laughs> yeah. And to set that kind of scene up of two countries that have, you know, been kind of rivals or have have the tension themselves in the past is fascinating. And I'll check that out. Uh, we didn't even get a chance to get into like black metal, death metal, and like the uh, which is That's another like, another time. Another, another time. We're gonna have to uh, because it is another piece metal. that comes from the Nordic Noir for sure. And that feel dark tourism and the dark and we'll even give yeah. diaper or darker yeah. into dark even darker uh, than morbid to darkness which is why i look forward to talking to you always stefan where can people yeah. find you on the internet and tell yeah. us a little uh, bit yeah. uh, more about uh, what my doing. company i run with my wife uh, it's called a uh, gameng it says here in the corner and uh, gameng uh, and you can find me on linkedin of course Stefan Peterson, Gameng, please connect to me. It's, it's fun to have a connection. And we love to meet uh, new people everywhere. Yeah, not and only value best. marketing, does, um, yeah. design thinking, tourism. Like, I really, I think you all are in, in to the types and places of marketing where people need to, to be heading into and really, really taking yeah. that empathetic and understanding, you know, human first view. I. Are you coming to the, are you going to be speaking in the States at all? Coming? Yeah, I, I hope so people. really soon. We were supposed to talk at the uh, the Midwest Digital Marketing Conference last year, but it went like, because of the pandemic, it became digital. That was a true uh, a Nordic noir feeling in that, you know, you prepare yourself for this and you talk 40 minutes and then they say, okay, thank you. And it's off. But I was somewhere in the world, you know. So right now it's a lot of webinars. Hopefully we come to US again. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to go to Kansas, maybe. Oh, we want to go to LA. I'm... We want to go to Chicago. We're going to go everywhere, you know. It's like uh, absolutely. You need to take some time and really we'll talk. We need to talk yeah. and set something up and just do something fun and figure out how you how to get you all over here uh for a bit. Because yeah. it's always great to take the trip, but it's always best to do it and get paid a little bit too. <laughs> you know? oh, yeah, we were supposed, remember that, Joe, we were supposed to visit uh, the Santa village with Santa Claus. No, we have, the I've, there's so much England. more to yeah. do. There's so much <laughs> so more to do. We have a lot of things to do. Huh? And I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we, and yeah. next time we might get into dark and paranormal tourism, which is, a whole, yeah. which is, is it as popular in Europe, I mean, Europe is so much older. Here, 200 years old is very yeah. ancient yeah, yeah, yeah. to yeah. us. And we get, there's a lot of haunted houses that are from the 1800s. So how is yeah. that in Europe? We totally, we go like this because of all the, the ghosts. houses, the ghosts, <laughs> we're everywhere. We, oh, it's foggy outside. No, it's not. It's ghosts. Again. That's just it's what we deal with. Yeah, that's where the depression yeah. comes from. Just the, Yeah, it is, it is quite <laughs> depressing so, to have so in your backyard all the time. Oh, well, that'll give us an it'll give us a list. fun to talk about next time. 
And now I'm getting creeped out here in the basement. So Stefan, as always, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank Talk you. To us a little bit at Nordic pleasure. more. And hope um, to meet you soon. And, uh, and then, oh uh, yeah, it, it will. Now that things are opening up, we're opening yeah. up. Travel's taking place, and uh, now I have a couple shows to watch. So I'll talk to you after I watch season one of the. Yeah. Show. So can can I can I end with just the list of it? You know, you Please. talk the Valander, and on Netflix you have the Jan Valander. It's yes. uh, really good. It's really really interesting. Also in uh, in this uh, Nordic noir thing, the Trapped from Iceland. Varg Veum, Norwegian, Syria, and Beck, of course, cream uh, movies. There are like 40 of them. Beck is called. You need to watch them, everybody. Because I'm there there's the list, fun. and we'll have the list in the show notes, and we'll have a little movie watching club and series club just to get everybody ready for the winter, you know, ready and prepped for the winter. So, so long, my, so long my friend. It was, so long. It was such Take a care. pleasure. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) And uh, uh, catch you all next time on the Pop Marketing Podcast.